So this is the Lotus Guide magazine, and today we're going to be introducing and interviewing Dr. Jacob Lieberman. Dr. Jacob Lieberman has a doctorate in ophthalmology or optometry and a PhD in vision science. He also has an honorary doctorate of science for his pioneering work with light and color. His search for a new model of wellness has led him to the use of vision exercises and color to assist his patients. He has helped thousands of people worldwide to see in a whole new way. So, Dr. Lieberman, when you say there's more to vision than meets the eye, what are you really saying? That's a huge question, so let's get a huge answer. First of all, we don't see with the eye. And ultimately, we don't even see with the mind. There is something that observes the activity of the body and simultaneously observes the, the activity going on in what we call mind. Ultimately, that is the final set of eyes. That is the place from where seeing originates. The amount of seeing that occurs is directly related to where the, which point the observer identifies seeing with. Are they seeing with the eye that has limitations of the um, that will limit the viewer to the construction of the perceptual apparatus. Are they limited to the mind? Then the viewer is limited to what the mind believes is true and not true, what it agrees with or doesn't agree with. Or are they identified with this noticer, this which is aware of what's happening in the mind and in the body, this particular point of observation, which is not a point, it's hard to talk about this, so I hope you can hear what I can't say. The, this particular place or identification with has no point of view. It's not limited by time and space. Now, having said that, so we don't think that I'm getting too esoteric, let's go back. 35 years ago, I wore glasses for nine years. I started doing some vision training on myself, which at the time I thought was like vision exercising. I kept reducing my prescription as I did this, gradually reducing my, my dependency on my glasses. One day I went into meditation I had a very profound experience. Without going into great depth on that experience, I came out of the meditation, my eyesight was clear. I went to my office, I checked myself on repeated eye charts, and could conclusively tell you that I was seeing 300% better than when I entered my meditation an hour prior. I then examined my eyes in the same way I would for my patients, except I could not see what the lens power was in the instrument, because I was actually behind it, asking myself the question I would normally answer the patient, you know, ask the patient, is it better this way or this way? When I came to what looked like the lens that gave me the best visual acuity, I came out from behind the device thinking the device would say zero, no prescription, even though I was totally led to believe that this was impossible. This was never discussed. This wasn't anything that science even recognized. I came out from behind my device. I looked at the instrument, and the instrument basically gives me the precise prescription I'm wearing in my glasses. In other words, <coughs> something happened that catalyzed the 300% improvement in eyesight with no change in the optics of the eyes. Now I have to question, what is that? What happened? How did it happen? And perhaps most importantly, 
who or what is seeing me. Because what that led me to realize is vision may be catalyzed by an interaction of light and the eye, but it's not occurring in the eye. In fact, my sense was that it's not even occurring in the brain, that there's something out. It's now 35 years later. I have never had a pair of glasses on my face since that day. I have never done any vision training since that day. What I'm sharing with you is that this single epiphany changed things permanently without any repetition, without any practice, without any maintenance, without any of that. So what I realized is that the brain, the mind, consciousness is very plastic, it's very flexible. Now it's a well-known thing. We now call it neuroplasticity. 35 years ago, who even knew about these kinds of things? So as a function of that, I had a direct experience that allowed me to realize that what is seen is different than what we think to see. And then I started to notice that I began to see things that the average person wasn't able to see. That what, we, what became obvious to me were aspects of seeing that were outside of the normal realm. One of the things I did, for instance, I, is I had a friend check me to see, um, took me into a laboratory and started showing me portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, we know that the average person, that vision uh, is, or, or light, is the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum between what we call 400 and 700 nanometers. That's usually the extent of what we can identify or see. When I did it on myself, I was able to go well into the ultraviolet and well into the infrared, which means that my capacity to detect and respond to something subtler that is typically not available to the human eye was there. Since that time, I have begun to notice many other things that perhaps sometimes you could say are invisible to many. I remember Jonathan Swift said, real vision is the ability to see the invisible. So I've had a profound transformation in the seeing mechanism, in my sense of what it is that is seeing, and that has given me some steps up on how to assist people. And the, the system that I developed, this i training system, which is a vision training device, was a way to allow the user to experience something about seeing without effort. Even though like it looks like an exercise device, it's totally different than that. So the whole idea was, could I create something that would allow people to experiment with tapping into the maximum potential of what it means as a human being to see? Yeah, you know, a lot of what you're talking about, I, I'm seeing in different aspects of life, and it seems like we, as a, not only as a people, but as a planet, it seems like we are evolving into different frequencies. And with this e evolution, I think we're going to get information. And it's interesting, a person like you that has an academic background can get this information and transmit it back out to where people can understand it a little bit and actually use it for their own enhancement, in this case, vision. You know, uh, my brand of science is common sense. If science remains in a language that is not understandable to the lay person, then it doesn't really 
it's not achieving its maximum use. Right. If, however, science merely supports or affirms our direct experience, then it can be of incredible use. So, for me, it's always been about how do you translate science into a new common sense so that every listener can say, oh, I know that. I've had that experience. And it's very, very important that that translation into everyday humanness and humanity take place. And so that has always been um, something that has come natural for me. How to translate either the science or even the subtle realms, if you go, into something that is just understandable so that when we communicate with each other, we're all the same height. Right. So what, what would you say to the person that says, seeing clearly is a physical function determined by the shape of our eyes only and vision improvement is impossible, which is exactly what my optometrist told me when he gave me glasses. Well, the first thing that I would ask them is, have they ever attempted to gradually reduce their prescription, or have they ever worked with vision training to see what the effect is? Because if you haven't had a direct experience, then what you are providing people is called opinion. Opinion is virtual. It's a belief. It's an idea. It does not take the place or even come close to direct experience. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you, I'm sharing with you what I experienced. I'm the first one to share with you that my experience may not be available and probably is not available to everyone. Someone else may have a different kind of experience that is not available to me. But all I'm doing is putting out, sharing my experience as a possibility. That's number one. Number two, having done a lot of work with infants and children, I can tell you that less than 1% of children are born needing glasses. That, in other words, they see clearly, and that's a fact, that's not opinion. So this change in shape of the eye that the optometrist is speaking about does occur, for instance, as a person becomes more nearsighted. But that isn't there in the beginning. And which is when perhaps we have the greatest degree of flexibility or um, potential, if you will. So I'm saying we need to take a look at what is the the cause of this lengthening phenomenon. What is the reason that vision deterioration is the biggest health epidemic in the world? Hardly anybody is born needing glasses. Two-thirds of the U.S. and world population need wear glasses or contact lenses. And more than 90% of the world's population will need glasses in their lifetime. Most people over 40 say their arms are not long enough. Many children in school have difficulty translating visual information into meaningful knowledge and have vision problems that affect their ability to attend, to read, to learn. Athletes have difficulty using visual information to hit the ball and make a home run. So when we talk about vision, we're not just talking about eyesight, that's a tiny piece of it. We're looking more, not so much at how you see, but what is the response 
to the scene. So in response to your optometrist, who I'm sure is doing their best to provide with you what they know, they can't give you opinion on things that they haven't had experience with. And unfortunately, as human beings, it's just so much we can do in a 24-hour day. So many of these things, you just have to see what happens. But by gradually reducing the eyeglass prescription, by doing some vision training, which is not vision exercise, it's really about neuroplasticity. It's about the brain, the mind, awareness, sort of re experiencing what it is to see versus what it is to look. See, most everyone is conditioned to believe that we have to make life happen. We have to find what we want. We have to become a success. We have to create our own reality. We have to choose properly. So we're always looking for something. The problem is that when you look for one thing, you miss everything you're not looking for. And the things that occur when you're not looking for them, the things that occur in that place, we say those are the surprises, those are the miracles, those are the spontaneous remissions of life. So if you really want to understand vision, you have to look at how the neurology is set up for the eyes to function. The eyes are not designed to look. They are designed to see. They are not designed to initiate vision. They are designed to respond to stimulation by light. In other words, prior to paying attention to anything, the eye makes a movement. And the movement is in response to being attracted or called by something called light. Now that's very interesting because light is the most mysterious something, even though it's not a thing, in the universe. It's total immaterial substance. There's no, nobody's ever seen the light. We experience brightness, but we don't see the light. We can't measure this particular phenomenon. It's everywhere all the time. So, and then of course you look at the Bible, and the Bible says that God is light. So what I'm suggesting is the eye is responding to a call from light. What is light? Light, from the physicist's point of view, is the fundamental energy that creates what we call the universe, what we call the life's experience. The intelligence of life is in this something called light, which calls the eye, which means, at a much deeper level, something is guiding us moment by moment. Something grabs the eye's attention, causes it to turn a certain way. The body then reorients itself, and we know where the next step is on our journey. That same information that enters the eye, and most of it is not related to eyesight and vision. A big part of it goes to the hypothalamus of the brain, which is what is called the brain brain, and the pineal organ, which is now known as the body's master organ or master gland, is called the regulator of regulators. It regulates everything. And when those particular portions of the brain, which, by the way, control not only all the hormonal activity, but control every life-sustaining function in the human body, when that occurs, Every cell and every cellular component at the same instance of time receives a knowing about what is happening in Mother Nature. What time of the day is it? What time of the year is it? Am I in California or in Bangladesh or in Japan? And based on that information, every aspect of our being orchestrates its internal mechanisms and then synchronizes itself with Mother Nature so that literally 
the inside of our being and what we call the outside begin to recognize that there's no side. There's just oneness. And so light is continually moving us towards a state of oneness. It's guiding our physical movement through life. It's guiding the physiological movement that keeps us in a congruent, coherent, inseparable, seamless relationship with the heartbeat of life itself. And then that mechanism I spoke about before, this noticer, is also receiving this information from life, which allows us to, if, if we are experiencing a state of grace, because that's the only word I know for it, it's not something I've ever found I can control, if that's happening, then we will get a very strong guidance on what the next movement is in our life, where we are to move to next. To give you an example, I don't know whether you're a parent or not, but if you're a parent, or even if you're not, every so often, you get a sense. It's almost like something flashes in your awareness. It could be your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, a friend. And something just moves you to pick up the phone and dial their number. And as soon as they hear your voice, they say, oh my God, I was just thinking of you. Now, every human being has had that experience and things like that that are more complex. How does that happen? What is that that we just sort of blow off and say, ah, it's just a coincidence, it's just synchronicity. Well, that is happening in my life every day, multiple times, over and over again, in very complex ways that I could not even begin to think about, much less explain. What is it that sees what has not yet occurred? So, are, so are, we, are, are we, are, excuse me, are, are we touching, like in your book, you're talking about open focus, yes. and that's a way of seeing nothing when you're looking at nothing but seeing everything. Are we touching on that subject right now? We are, we are touching upon that, and somewhat beyond that, what I'm saying is that we are a receptive field that is continually being impinged upon and guided, called in a certain direction by the intelligence that innervates everything in life. The wind, the movement of the planets, the, the tides, the seasons. That's exactly what brings us that same animating force. <clears throat> when that is the guiding force, then we, we are merely responding to life rather than trying to create life, which means it's effortless. And when that occurs, something can really, really shift with the feeding mechanism. And sometimes it can result in a spontaneous clearing of the eyesight. And so for me, uh, one is to share this with the listener because they need to in some way see whether this message touches them. If something says, oh, of course this is the case, then a new possibility my experience that happened to me 35 years ago, by sharing that experience, I can in some way offer the license to have that experience to others. It's sort of like the first guy that broke the four-minute mile. Nobody could do it before that. Right. As soon as he broke the four-minute mile, <clears throat> everyone started breaking the four-minute mile. As soon as Bob Hayes broke the 100-yard dash record, everyone started. So I'm not, it isn't that I've created something new. I didn't create anything. I'm merely sharing an experience that I'm having. And when you listen to it, if something inside of you says, oh, yeah, then you know what I'm talking about. 
And just that oh yeah creates an epiphany that sometimes can cause your neurology to change quite instantaneously. So that's the first step. And then, of course, there are tools that allow one to experience that awareness in such a way that it can help the mechanism along. You know, what, what you're talking about reminds me of the stories when the Westerners showed up on the horizon with their big ships. The native people couldn't see those ships because neurologically they weren't wired to see something like that because it wasn't in their experience. But the shamans and the people that were forward thinkers were the ones that could see it first. And right. by them seeing it first and taking the, the people down to the shore and pointing it out, they were eventually able to see it too. Yes. 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 It's, it's, it's the phenomenon of that believing is seeing. And there's something beyond that, which is seeing from a place that has no beliefs. And then all of a sudden, a world of opportunity or a world of possibility um, is triggered or catalyzed um, in an entirely new way. And as I said, I don't know of any technique for this. It's just beginning to share these experiences and touching each other's awareness in the process that creates this paradigm shift, this quantum leap that allows for the whole new level of being. You know, Jacob, I, I wrote a book called To Believe or Not to Believe, The Social and Neurological Consequences of Belief Systems. And in the process of writing that book, I dismantled a lot of my beliefs. And a lot of these beliefs went back to the Iron Age, but as I dismantled them, it became uh, apparent at some point that it could get a little scary because as I dismantled my beliefs of God, for instance, I, I noticed there was a vacuum there. But as I dismantled those beliefs, my comprehension of whatever God is expanded in such a way and I realized that it wasn't confined to the walls of a, a church or a synagogue or a belief system. It expanded beyond everything that I'd ever believed or even thought of into this other realm of awareness that doesn't really allow for beliefs. It only allows for experience. And in reality, in reality, the word God is just a three-letter simple word that we use to speak about that vacuum, limitless experience that you're speaking about. Even though people would like to say, oh, God is God, or God is Jesus, or God is Muhammad, or God has these ideas. When you, once you've had, the belief is virtual, Direct experience is absolute. Once you've had a direct experience, then all of a sudden you realize whatever you call it, it isn't it. Because it isn't an it. It has no name. It has no qualities that you can describe. It's not something that is understandable by what we call mind. It's just something that when it touches us, we experience something and we're left speechless. <laughs> and uh, This may be uh, why they call it a mystery. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so what, while we're on this subject, you know, it's... It's so easy to look at religions and see that they definitely need to catch up to the 21st century, what we know, at least factually, what we know about science and quantum physics. But it seems that most of our sciences are making an attempt to catch up with quantum physics, like epigenetics, for instance, in biology. 
Okay. But uh, do you feel that ophthalmology is going through this transition also? Probably not. <laughs> um, you know, the, the reality of the situation is that science, by definition, is supposed to continually be looking at the fringe at the outermost edge. What's interesting is that's real scientific spirit looking at the unknown to try to gain some understanding of the unknown. Unfortunately, much of science has become scientism, like Catholicism or Judaism. Right. And they have forgotten that their roots are in the mystical realm. The real scientists initially experience the seed that spurs them into a journey <clears throat> through a mystical experience. Something drops in from where we do not know. That starts the process. You could call that inspiration. Inspiration is the initial catalyst that begins the scientific search into the process of perspiration that over time can become transformation. But without that inspiration in the beginning, which is the mystical piece, which is the, the the person experiencing something for which they have no explanation, then if you don't include that, then the science is limited to just another idea, just another religion. And all of these things should be structures without limits, no walls on these particular things. What quantum physics physicists have come in contact with is that the nature of reality cannot be described, cannot be put into an equation, cannot be understood by the mind, and yet it can be experienced. Yeah, we, we can't even look at reality without changing it. Precisely, precisely. And so, and that's because we look at reality rather than see it. If there is, you see, quantum mechanics talks about the fact that the observer is inseparably involved with what is observed. And that, of course, came from the experiments that looked at light through a device that measured um, uh, waves versus a device uh, that just me measured little points of energy and particles, what we call it. So when you look at light through a particle measuring device, you measure particles. When you look at a, at a light with a device that measures waves, it measures waves. And so it seems like the observer or the perceptual apparatus or lens of the observer is directly related to what is observed. But it's not taken far enough. What if the observer has no point of view? And this is what I'm talking about. What occurs if we are just noticing versus looking for? And that's the magic right there. Yeah, that's but... the real magical place. And that's the place that is is difficult for most people to access because they're trying to get there and the trying 
literally closes all the gates. Yeah, because what, what you're saying too is at the root of most of our conflict is our perceptual differences only. Right. Not what we're looking at, not, not the ideas and the ideals and the, even the idea of God. It's mostly our separate perceptions. So if we could go into a unity of observance instead of perceptual angles, that would solve a lot of world conflict, I believe. Well, you know something, you merely need to do a very simple experiment. Let's say that I'm standing here, and on my right is a bee, and next to the bee is a snake, and next to the snake is a shark. And all of us are looking at a flower. Now, you understand what I see when I tell you I'm looking at a red rose. Now the bee is looking at that same rose, but they don't experience life through the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. They experience it through the ultraviolet. They don't at all see what we see. The snake experiences reality through the infrared portion. They see something totally different from the bee and something totally different from me. The shark is just seeing in different shades of gray. They see something totally different than the rest of us. But we're all looking at what we think is the same thing. Right. So here's humanity, all looking at something like whatever we call God. And each of us looking at it through this lens, we call it this point of view, and actually believe that my thing is more accurate than yours. But if you look at the situation that I just described to you, <clears throat> we're all looking at supposedly the same flower, but we're not seeing anything at all like the other. So then the next question is, what's out there? Is it really a flower? Or is it the energy that comprises what our perceptual mechanism causes us to create in that form that we call a flower? If we realize that this phenomenon that exists between the bee, the snake, the, the shark, and myself is essentially the same as human beings each seeing through a different point of view, a different perceptual uh, system, then we realize that what we're all looking at is just the invisible energy that when it interacts with consciousness creates the experience we call life. But what we're seeing has nothing to do with what's real. It's right. only what's real to us. Once we begin to recognize the truth of that, and that's quite verifiable, then you begin to dismantle this idea that my view of reality is correct, rather than realizing that my view of reality may be different than yours because we're looking through different eyes, but neither one is correct. They're just different views. There's no way we see the whole elephant. So, so Jacob, uh, a lot of people are, are going to be watching this on things like YouTube also, and a lot of those people are young people, and they've been sort of indoctrinated into a soundbite thing. So. And there seems to be an epidemic of vision impairment, even in young people. Right. What would you say to that generation that's sort of dependent on short sound bites that would be concise enough to catch their attention and have them take action? A few very simple things. Spend time without your glasses on in a safe environment and notice the feelings that arise when you remove your glasses. Because the feelings that arise when you remove your glasses are very similar to the feelings you had before the very first time you got glasses. They are, in fact, the 
emotional things that were going on that caused Dickinson in some way to close down. Or part of you said, gee, that's a hard thing for me to look at. That's number one. Number two, they might consider uh, the use of this iPort vision training system that I developed. I'm not interested in selling iPort, so let me just make it clear that this is not a marketing thing. But I want to share with you what this is. This is a FDA cleared, uh, <coughs> clinically proven device with scientific studies that significantly improves overall visual performance. What do I mean by that? Attention, reading uh, efficiency, reading comprehension, how fast, how accurately, and how appropriately you respond to things. Many people respond that they can see clearer. We have no studies about that. We make no claims about that. But after 20,000 in use and more than 1,000 doctors recommending it to their patients, I'm just sharing the feedback that we get. What's the value of the device? It allows you to experience how to begin to see without effort. When that happens, some of these other realms that I mentioned begin to open. As the system becomes more flexible, just in a state of flow, rather than in a state of looking at life through its point of view, then a person's maximum potential becomes available because we're supposed to see life as a whole, not through a whole. With effort, we look at life through a whole, through a very limited lens, if you will. Vision is much more than meets the eye. This is why when people say, I see, it doesn't mean I see the eye chart. It means I understand. A visionary is a visionary because their ability to see what is not visible to others. All of this, these are all different steps that come from a basic allowance of vision to function without effort. So the iPort allows the user a way of experiencing this that over time, uh, and it doesn't take much time, can improve visual performance very significantly. Well, I can tell you this, uh, Dara and I, we ordered the iPort. She's been using it for three weeks now, and already she doesn't need her reading glasses. And mm. I think that's a substantial improvement. You know, um, as I said, we, we've not done studies on this, so we don't make claims. Most of what you see uh, on the web, unfortunately, are promises that have to do with marketing something. Right. Uh, my dream from the beginning was very clearly this. I had a vision, I had an experience 35 years ago. I wanted to see if I could make that available to the everyday person uh, without having to spend thousands of dollars. So I had a vision, I invented a product, we patented the product, we have four peer-reviewed published studies, which means that they have been, they have gone through the peer review process, which is the most stringent process, to be published. They, it's the only device that's gone through the FDA and been cleared by the FDA as a medical device directly available to the public, over the counter, if you will. For me, it was important to have an evidence-based product, something that had real science behind it so people could have confidence in its use. So, yeah, and I can verify the, the fact that it seems to work very well, at least in our case. That's See, great. You know, I, I was thinking, Jacob, as a final thought, do you think there's a relationship between the light of consciousness and the actual light we let into our eyes? Absolutely. They're exactly the same light. You see, because as David Bohm, who was a very renowned physicist who passed away, David Bohm said, all matter is frozen light. In other words, everything we experience, from consciousness to physicality, is just something that's constructed of, of an energy called light. 
light spans everything from the material world to the non-material world because light is actually non-material. It's not a something. And yet, that formless uh, non-material something is the ground of creation for everything that we experience. So, yes, the light of consciousness, the light that interacts and moves the eye, the light that moves the body, it, the intelligence of light itself animating everything. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. This has been a very enlightening conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I, um, I've been so touched by this phenomenon, initially in my eyesight, to a profound transformation of my insight, to the discovery of what it truly means to see. And now it's something that's that light of awareness, that light that interacts with consciousness, is now guiding me so continually that it's a very humbling experience. I don't know what more to, to say. You know, people interview me and they often say, well, do you have a list of questions? No. I, the idea is to live in the question. Right. In the unknown, in the choicelessness, when that happens, you get touched and a question comes through you. Your question touches something in me and an answer comes through me. It looks as though you're asking the questions and I'm answering. But don't be fooled by that. It's the light of consciousness linking us both up <clears throat> for reasons we don't understand so that we can share something that is touching to us and hope that that sharing can become contagious. Very well said. All Have right. a grateful day. Yep, you too, Jacob. And uh, I'll be in touch. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye.